Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro. I'm a past president of the North American Menopause Society. And in our ongoing lecture series, I am so pleased to have Dr. Susan Reed join me today. She's the 2022-2023 president of the North American Menopause Society, a professor emeritus in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She's an adjunct professor of epidemiology at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle. Now, we know that so many women do not seek any type of management or pharmacological therapy for menopausal symptoms. They're having hot flashes, they're having night sweats, yet they're not coming forward. And we know that at least one in two women do not seek medical treatment. Often it's because of concerns about safety that are not necessarily founded. So there's definitely an opportunity for us to be reviewing what is out there. And now we have some newer options that are non-hormonal that we'd like to talk about as well. So let's firstly talk about treatment for moderate to severe vasomotor symptoms and really talk about that gold standard of hormone therapy that has gotten abandoned over the years and hopefully is finding its moment again. Yes. So first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Shapiro, for inviting me on today. As this audience knows, menopausal hot flashes affect up to 80% of half the world's population, which is around 3 billion people, most who identify as women. And they result in diminished quality of life, challenges at work, sleep, and mood. And our gold standard for treating hot flashes has been postmenopausal hormone therapy. We know that uh, from studies, the efficacy for hormone therapy is around a decrease of 2.6 hot flashes per day beyond a placebo effect. And I take this from actually the Cochrane database because as we look at the FDA approved products today, the rigor behind those phase three clinical trials are very different today than when conjugated equine estrogen or Premarin was first approved by the FDA in 1942. So a little different, and we need to think about that as we uh, think about comparing these. Everybody knows that there are some folks that have contraindications to hormone therapy, but in addition, as Dr. Shapiro uh, alluded, some folks just don't wanna take uh, hormone therapy because of concerns. So um, after counseling, healthy people who are up to age 60 and, and letting them know that hormone therapy is efficacious and safe, there's still individuals that have uh, concerns, mainly around so, breast cancer. Yeah, breast cancer, heart disease, cancer, yeah. stroke, we know all yeah. those. So, you know, even as much as the numbers are low, when you really meet someone who just won't or cannot, um, we talk about non-hormonal pharmacological treatment, and, and we've talked about the things that are out there, but this is a very exciting time now that we're facing with the advent of some new novel medications with novel mechanisms of action that have just met approval in the United States. So let's talk about what's new in these non-hormonal pharmacological treatments that are not off-label, but on-label specifically designed for hot flashes and night sweats. Right. So up until May 12th, 2023, there was a single non-hormonal therapy that was FDA approved for hot flashes, and that was paroxetine. And we know from those uh, studies that we see a decrease of about 1 to 1.5 hot flashes per day above placebo. But as uh, Dr. Shapiro indicated, we are at a watershed moment. This is phenomenal. As I said, hormone therapy back in 1942, and then very little FDA approved. And this is really uh, big, big, big news for women's health and for menopausal women. So this new class of drugs are called NKB antagonists. They act at the area in the brain called the candy neuron complex. And the first drug that was FDA approved on May 12th was bezalinotant. And there's a second drug, elanzanotant, that is completing phase three safety and efficacy studies. So a couple of very, very, very exciting medications. What's amazing about all this is we finally, the science behind the development of this new group of uh, drugs or medications is incredibly powerful because it speaks to the importance of understanding the mechanism of hot flashes first and targeting that area. 
I can tell you a little bit more, Dr. Shapiro, about the history of these uh, medications. I think what we'd like to know about is what we've learned about how these neuroreceptors work in target with estrogen, and then what happens when estrogen is removed when we go into menopause. How is this different than hormone replacement or hormone therapy? So these drugs act upstream from the area where estrogen works in the brain. The, the sites of action are, are side by side within the hypothalamus. And the, the GnRH neurons, which respond to estrogen, are right next to the thermoregulatory center. So the history of this is incredible. And our, our colleague, Naomi Rance, uh, literally decades ago, recognized in autopsy studies of menopausal women, these candy neurons were massive. They were hundreds of thousand times bigger than they should have been in a premenopausal woman. And, and what she saw was that there was crosstalk into the thermoregulatory center from these neurons. And, and indeed, what we've learned through the years is that if you can tamp down these hyper-stimulated hypertrophy NKB or candy, the candy neurons, that we uh, can decrease risk of hot flashes. So when estrogen disappears, these hypertrophy <laughs> leading to that hot flash, now we understand it. And by putting in the antagonist, we're essentially mimicking what estrogen would have did, would have done by keeping it now more in balance. That's it's correct. So, so this area is called the candy neuron complex. That's kispeptin, which we now know governs the, the uh, GnRH pulse generator that brings on puberty and also seems to be at play at menopause. We see the LH pulses with hot flashes. And most women are mimicked, they correlate pretty much. So there's something going on there. So that's the kispeptin. The N is neurokinin B, and that's the NK3 antagonists that were just developed. NK, NKB actually puts on the accelerator here. Right? So by adding an antagonist, you tamp down the system. And then the third player in the works is dynorphin. And dynorphin acting as an agonist controls the NKB. At least these are the, seem to be the ongoing theory. Some of them um, not as strong as others, but the data around the NK3R receptor antagonist looks super strong. And that's what we're talking about today. So let's talk about who can and cannot, because now we're not talking so much about a window of opportunity within the first decade of menopause. We're now talking about working at the site where the thermoregulatory zone is. This is not a hormone. So who's our group of women who can be candidates in terms of age, in terms of symptoms? Who would we be talking to about this? So that's a great, a wonderful question. I, among my colleagues, we have discussed so for example, an individual who plans a bilateral salpingo oophorectomy for various reasons, might you start one of these uh, medications prior to surgery such that you don't let these neurons hypertrophy and blow, blow essentially they blow up. And the theory here is that you would control them before they get um, massive and out of control. Now studies to date look super strong because, because the two products uh, that I'm, I'm gonna talk about a little bit more, the fezolinaton, that which, which was uh, FDA approved and, and the elanzenaton act very rapidly within days. And mm -hmm. we see statistical significance within seven to 14 days. So uh, biologically, we worry about how big these neurons get but the whole uh, system seems to come under control fairly rapidly, even in individuals who've been having hot flashes for years. As yeah, so it's really a nice option for women who have waited and whereas they no, may no longer be a candidate for estrogen because they're approaching that 10 year mark where the risk becomes important in terms of outweighing benefit. Now let's talk about side effects because some of these medications have been associated with an increase in liver function. So what do we need to monitor and what do we need to be attentive to? So the first studies with a, another drug called Pavinat, Pavinaton showed uh, abnormal liver functions in three out of 28 individuals that were over five point times 
uh, 5.9 times the upper limits of normal. And that stopped that drug dead in the tracks. I'm super reassured about what we've seen from both of these drugs uh, in that if you look at the phase three randomized controlled trial data that was published in Lancet and then in Journal of Clinical Endocrinology in, in 2023, we really see very little there of concern. However, the FDA is being super cautious. So for fesalinotont, which was FDA approved, we saw increases in liver function uh, tests uh, in uh, one of the individuals on placebo, two in a lower dose fesalinotont, and zero in the higher fesalinotont uh, dose, which to me looks really great. And in the Alenzenotont, we only have a phase 2b trial that was just published in menopause by James Simon, and we did not see differences there uh, between the groups in abnormal liver functions. So the FDA has placed warnings on the fesalinotont, and they recommend blood work at baseline to check for, uh, to see if the liver is functioning normally to begin with, and then checking every three months LFTs, giving patients um, warning signs around signs of potential abnormal liver function. I think that's being very cautious. It is being cautious, but I think we yes. want to point out that unlike menopausal hormone therapy with an intact uterus, whether you have an intact uterus or don't have an intact uterus, nothing changes. It's the same medication for both populations because this does not work the same way at all. It's working on the level of the brain. This is correct. What we do know, uh, Dr. Shapira, from some of the phase one data, when they had super high doses of both of these uh, drugs, there was a suggestion that we were seeing some effects on LHFSH, estrogen, and testosterone, if you look really careful at those very early studies. But at the doses we're talking about here, really, my understanding is we are not seeing perturbations in hormones what's, whatsoever. And the last question before I let you go is that forgotten group of women um, with breast cancer, whether they're ER positive or ER negative, have been left with, as you mentioned, paroxetine as an option, a non-hormonal option. But this is an exciting time to consider that this group of women who really have had not a lot of therapies available to them now may have a new therapy for them because it will not impact on estrogen receptors at all. That is absolutely correct. Now, to my knowledge, and you, you might add in the conversation here that there are not studies specifically in right. women with breast cancer, but there's no indication that they should be at higher risk. I want to remind everybody at this point that it's important that estrogen does have benefits for bone, mm -hmm. for vaginal dryness, that uh, for individuals taking breast cancer medications that really change their hormones, they may have uh, need uh, other medications for their bones and for vaginal health. Yeah, clearly each group is going to have its own additional issues. Mm -hmm. But in terms of a new watershed moment, a novel mechanism of action, something that really is exciting in women's health, I'm so glad you've joined us to open the door to the conversation. As we go forward in time, we'll be looking for real world data. We'll be looking for groups such as women with breast cancer to be studied. But I would say that this is a pretty exciting time. And I thank you so much for coming on so close to the launch to have our NAMS healthcare practitioners be informed. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.